Hello and thank you for joining me for this month's drawing tutorial. This month we're going to draw a portrait of an older lady, so we're going to have the complications of wrinkles in the skin and um, kind of wrinkles around the mouth, not to mention this really dark background. So let's go ahead and get started. First go ahead and print out your reference material on a piece of paper and then measure even increments around all four sides. Make sure that those increments are the same and labeled the same from top to bottom and from side to side. So in my case, I labeled the horizontal top and bottom 1 through 9 and my verticals on both sides A through I. Then I measured a proportional rectangle on my drawing paper and I measured the increments so that they're exactly the same as my reference material and this helps me to make an external grid that I can use for laying down the external shapes of the face quickly and accurately. So once you have that grid down you can use the letters and numbers to refer to to give you a place to ref um, to give you a point of reference between the picture and your drawing. So for instance the top of the head is right here the quarter above A on the horizontal axis and we can have the center right at the center of um, the center of the nose falls right on the 5 the way that I cropped it. So I did go ahead and crop in some of that black space. When you print out your reference it's going to be more rectangular and it doesn't matter whatever shape you want to, to crop it to is just fine. I made mine a little bit smaller so that the portrait could be a little bit larger. But then start marking down those grid marks. So remember we were five and about a quarter for the top of the head so I just put a little dot there. And I'm using charcoal so that it's darker and easier to see on film. But you can also use graphite which is actually what I usually draw with. Bottom of the chin here is right below the H. So I can use my triangle to make sure that I'm putting those marks down accurately. And then when I have enough of them, I'll do the side of the face the same way. And uh, then you can connect those. So make sure that you know where you were measuring. And if there's anything that lines up precisely, those are going to be your most helpful because you'll know that those are going to be accurate. So here on the four is the quarter, is the um, edge of the eye, but it's not quite, so that's not an, a precise measurement. Also the eyes, you can see, since we're using the grid, they're at a slight angle. So if I put my straight edge on the bottom of both eyes, it's going to go from D down here to a little above the, uh, a little below the E. So you can also use your grid for putting down those angles accurately. And you can also use it a little bit more informally to just sketch in the large shapes quickly even with just two. So I have the top of the head and the bottom of the head. I can go ahead and start even there and start laying those shapes in. So I know that the neck is going to be here at about the 7, go up to about the F and a half. That's going to be the bottom of the ear. And I'm just doing this a lot more quickly by eyeballing it more. I'm still using the grid, but I'm not being quite as fussy. So that's especially useful if you don't need it to be exactly accurate, but you can still put those shapes down quickly because of the grid. So however you choose to use it so that it's most beneficial for you is just fine. See, I'm looking here too at the external shape, the negative shape, this black around the hair. And I'm using that shape to help me lay this down accurately too. 
since these are proportional spaces, these shapes are going to look the same if I've done it right. And as I go, I'm continually referring to my graph just to see if I'm lining up in about the right places. So the D should be around the, uh, the top of the ear should be right around the, between the D and the E, and that's where it is on my sketch, so I'm feeling confident about that. Outside of the ear should be about where it is. So here I'm just using a combination of eyeballing and negative shapes and my graph all together to quickly put down the shape of the head. And then like I say, wherever the picture bisects the graph specifically, that's going to be really easy to make very accurate. So this neck fold is right at four and that's going to help me determine oh how far up the head goes and G and G4 this point is important because it helps me to know how uh, wide to make the head that's where the bottom of the ear needs to be And then as you make mistakes, use your kneaded eraser. I always have it ready in the other hand to just clean up as I go along. This is the shape of the hair on the head. Those external points that I've given myself with the graph really help to hold me to um, these measurements. So if I know that this is where the bottom of the ear has to be, then I sort of need to make my other lines fit that. And that's really handy because it's like having a compass right there on your drawing so that if you start wandering too far in the wrong direction, you can always refer to those guide points. It's like, okay, well this is something I know has to go here, so therefore I need to make some adjustments in other places to make that fit. If you don't have that, you can easily get lost in your picture and uh, suddenly you step back and the portrait doesn't look anything like what you wanted it to because it's gone just really badly awry somewhere down the line. So that's yet one more thing that the grid does for us. It's like the drawing's compass. Okay, now I'm going to put down the angle of the bottom of the eyes. Carefully find this angle by lining up your straight edge right across the bottom of both eyes. And you can see it's bisecting the D and E and a third. So D, E and a third should be about right here. Really, really lightly put that down. And then a guideline for the center of the head, a line that goes right through the middle of the eyes and the middle of the mouth. That's going to be above the, about a quarter before the five and quarter after the five. So quarter below, quarter before, quarter after. Really lightly put that down as well. It's looking pretty accurate for what I see, um, according to what I see on the drawing. Then bottom of the nose, if I have a line that touches these nostrils and the center of the nose, the septum, that's going to be between the F and G and about a quarter below the E. F and G, 
quarter below the E. It should be about right here. And then I'll just do a guideline for the mouth, the center of the mouth. It's about the same distance below the F and the G. It's about to right about there. Now, once I have those guidelines, I can start to sketch the shapes of those features. And you can also take a scrap piece of paper and measure the features in terms of eye length. So if I just mark down the length of one eye, make sure that you remember what you are measuring to. Is it the inner corner or is it this corner of the skin? Whichever it is, you need to be consistent. Her eyes are way farther apart if I do it that way, so I'm gonna go from the outer corner of the skin on both. That's right, okay, so it's from outer corner of skin, outer corner of skin, then they're an eye length apart. Both eyes are the same width. The distance to the bottom of one eye, one eye length down from the bottom of one eye is about the top of the nostrils. An eye length down from there is a little bit above the middle of the mouth. An eye length down from there gives us this line on the chin. It's about halfway between the bottom of the mouth and the bottom of the chin. And then it's not, it's a little bit more than an eye length down. The chin is a little bit above another eye length down from there. So I can do that same system with my eye length in mind. I can just mark down one eye length by basically guessing. Okay, so if this is my eye length, that means that this eye would start here and end here, which looks too small already. So let's just extend that out a little bit. Okay, if this is my eye length. Corner, corner, and then this is my new eye length. This is the bottom of the eye. So here is going to be about the top of the nostril. Then this will be the middle of the, this is middle of the chin is supposed to be a little bit lower according to my eye length theory. And this one is about right. And that's about right. So I can use a combination of those two systems and start to sketch in the shape of my features. Let's see which of these lines do I like? Okay. So when you're sketching those shapes of the features, Just try to abide by the guidelines that you've given yourself already. And make sure that you keep them on the same angles that you already found, otherwise they're going to be slanting the wrong way. You'll put a lot of work into your eyes and your nose and everything just to find out that they're not quite right. So then this is supposed to be bottom of the septum, and this is the nostril here. The nostrils are about an, they usually line up with about the inside corners of the eyes. Her nose goes a little bit beyond that. So I'm just sketching in these shapes pretty roughly, pretty quickly. Then I've got this divot. Sketching in the mouth really quickly. The corners of the mouth usually line up with the centers of the eyes. So 
So what I'm basically looking for here is whether or not the features all fit on the face and do they look even remotely recognizable as this woman's face. And I'm finding that so far they do. They're fitting there. And so as soon as possible, I'm going to erase my guidelines so that I can start refining those shapes now that I know that they're at least approximately in the right place. So I erase those guidelines. This is why it's really, really important to draw very lightly in this stage. And I can still make adjustments, of course, but from here on out, they shouldn't be huge. I shouldn't have to move an eye way over, for instance. Let me just quickly mark in where the eyebrows would go, about here and here, I'm just eyeballing that. Bottom of the bangs, curling about there. Got these really severe wrinkles. Okay, and she's looking at least a little bit recognizable. That's all I want at this point. Now don't start adding the smaller details yet because you still need to polish these features up enough so that they are, um, you need to polish up the large features before you start to shave away at the smallest details of those features. So before you start adding eyelashes, get everything up to speed to the same point of development and make sure that the eyes are the right shape and on the right place on the head and the right size. Otherwise you're going to have to erase it all, including those hard and hard works on eyelashes and you'll be back at square one but now it's even smudgier and smearier because you have to erase all those eyelashes on top of everything else so do yourself a favor and do it logically large shapes first small shapes after and now I'm just sort of bobbing from feature to feature cleaning it up what can also help too is if you angle your paper so that to you it looks like you're going straight across, but when you're finished with the drawing, that head will be at the proper tilt. So if you have a trouble, if you have problems consistently drawing your heads at the tilt that they're supposed to be at, try tilting your entire paper. That can help. All right, let me just bring this up a little bit. It's just a matter of going over the features little by little and making some small adjustments and I'll come back when it's pushed up a little bit farther and um, I'll show you how to put those finishing details on the features before you start shading. Okay, I have the features and some of the main um, lines of the face on a little bit better place now, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward to the next step, which is adding a base tone to the skin. The base tone is not the same as the shadow tone. It's just what you put down first because nobody has paper white skin. And so what you're going to do is tilt the paper so that you can work back and forth really smoothly. And then I'm going to use my charcoal pencil and I'm holding it way at the bottom so that I'm not applying any pressure at all and then I'm just going to smoothly go back and forth across the whole skin tone. She does have very light skin, but like I say, it's not paper white. So this is a stage where we're just going to tone that down. Cover everything except the whites of the eyes and the teeth if the mouth is opened. Of course hers isn't. So don't neglect the neck and the shoulders if anything like that is showing. And then just smooth back and forth strokes like this. You don't want to apply any pressure because you want it all to blend out really smoothly and just disappear. So none of these lines will be visible at all. And try to keep the contour of the head in mind when you work so you're not just scribbling randomly back and forth. Your strokes should be curved a little bit, especially when there are some 
pretty pronounced curves. And then just carry it all the way down and this is where her skin tone ends, just way down here. Going right over the lips, almost done here. And if you want to keep this line down at the bottom nice and precise, you can just use a piece of masking tape. Tape it to your clothes one so it doesn't stick too much and tear the paper. And then just carefully go right up against that line. Don't do this stage until you're done with the drawing because you don't want your numbers to be too covered up. This will keep that nice and clean while we are doing the shading part. So next get a chamois cloth. Chamois cloth works much better than anything else for this stage, but if you don't have a chamois you can use a clean tissue or a piece of felt. And then just start at the top and circle stroke down, cover everything, and you should see those pencil strokes disappearing and leaving this nice, smooth, light skin tone behind. That's exactly what you're looking for. Then, when that's done, get something like a piece of tracing paper or a clean piece of paper, any kind, that you can rest your hand on while you're working. You need to go back over the features and those most important lines and bring them out again if needed, just so they don't get lost after that blending to get really light. shouldn't take too long because they're still faint. I'm just bringing them out a little bit. Notice that I'm not outlining and I'm not pressing too hard. So there are no lines on the face. There's just shapes, so we don't want it to look like a coloring book. And I'm just making some indications here and there. And then we're ready to start the second stage, which is adding the actual shadow shapes to the face. So this is just the same as adding the base tone. You're just going to pull your reference material close. And I'm going to add some base tone to the shadows on the hair as well. In the shadow shapes on the hairs, you don't have to pay so much attention to the direction of the hair because they're going to get blended out the same way um, but if you have some light hairs pulling over darker areas, then you can indent those with a stylus. Something that's um, sharp but won't tear the paper. 
So you're just looking for an indenting tool. This is my favorite tool to use for this. It's a two-ended stylus, a Dick Blick 1411 stylus. And using this, I can just indent the paper in these white areas, and I can make it look like there are some flyaway hairs, and there are some white hairs, and there are some lighter colored hairs that are crossing over the rest of the shape of the hairstyle. So that helps to add a lot of realism. So I'm just going to add those here and there before I start adding too much tone. And I can go with that larger tip in some places, a smaller one in other places. And then you can add that tone the same way. So I can go in the dark areas here by the head and see how those indented hairs are already popping out. So I'm adding some hair like this, concentrating on the shadow shapes. And then in the face too, I'm going to be adding some shadow shapes. So um, some shadows in the ear. And then most of the shadows on her face are on this side because that's the direction of the light coming this way. So I'm going to focus on this side. And when I add those shadow shapes, I want them to be as smooth as possible so I can put them down with little circle strokes with my pencil. And I'm always going the same direction, just back and forth. You're not gonna suddenly start going up and down when you're adding these. Short controlled strokes for the small shapes and then you can go a little bit longer, longer strokes for some of those larger shapes. I can add some tone to the lips. But mostly I'm not adding any lines yet. I'm just working on the shapes of the shadows. So let me finish adding these shadow shapes and I'll come back and show you how to blend them out. Okay, this is what it looks like when the shadow shapes are in place. Notice how they all sort of connect into one big shape on the face, that's what you should strive for. You don't want to look at the features as separate parts of the face. Like you're working on the eyes and then the nose and then the mouth. Even though you are, try to think of it as working on one big thing that has the light hitting it all at the same time. So that's going to help bump up the realism of your face. After all, in reality, the sun does hit the face all at the same time and so the intricate shadow shapes do play over all of the features and sort of um, intermingle and combine. So now we're going to take a stump, which is one of these things. It's just rolled up paper. Sometimes they're called tortillons. It's the same thing. And we're going to use circle strokes just like this to blend those shadow shapes into the rest of the tone of the face. And sometimes I'm going to be using a little bit longer stroke like this. But usually I'm just going to circle stroke around. You'll find that you don't have to change your tortillon out as much if you work from the light areas to the dark which I'm not doing right now because I wanted to see how dark my dark shapes would blend out. They're looking pretty good. All right, 
So this is the method. I'm going to do the similar blending style in the hair, except that in the hair I'm going to concentrate on following the growth patterns. So moving in the same direction as the hair growth, or if the hair is pulled back, then the same direction as those pulled back hairs. So like this, and then you're just sort of tracing what you see. And it's pretty fast because this is essentially a base tone check for the hair. So you don't have to be too finicky with it. Make sure that you are following the patterns of the curls to sort of emphasize that this hair down here is curly. Just using the tip of the tortillon to get that done and leave some white areas because the top of each curl is going to be in highlight. Moving on down the face, don't be afraid to move your paper if you need to get a more comfortable angle. And just circle stroke all of the, all those shadow shapes until it's nice and blended. So let me finish this up and come back to you when that's done. Okay, those shadow shapes are blended now, so now we have to move forward into adding the more details to the features. I'm going to protect that face with my... I'm going to lay down the piece of paper to protect the um, drawing again, keep my reference material close, and then I'm going to start doing things like adding the pupil to the eye, adding some tone to the iris, Notice how I outlined the iris first. Getting some dark in there on the lids and in the corners of the eye. And as you do this step, you're just keeping that reference material close so you can constantly see what the features are supposed to look like where there's supposed to be darks, where there's supposed to be highlights. And you're just working it up little by little. So I'm going to get this eye to about this stage and then I'm gonna go over and get the second eye to about the same stage of finishness. If you work up the whole face at about the same rate, then you can see and make adjustments as you go along a little bit more easily. Then if you finish up one eye, then you take a look at it and you notice that the um, eye's in the wrong place or something. So I work first on adding the darkest darks. Nostrils, pupils, A line between the lips and in the corner of the mouth. And if the portrait still looks correct after those are in place, then I can feel more confidence in moving forward some more. I'm also going to work on the hair at the same time. Then once those darks are in place, I'll use a small stomper tortillon and just blend them smooth a bit. If you 
we focus in a little bit on the eyes, you can see how this goes a little bit better. Add some shading with a small torchion, fill in the pupil, add a bit of tone to the iris, and the corners of the eye, just doing some things like this. So I'm working small now, and sometimes I might have to go back up to the larger tortillon and get some more tone in some of the larger places, like by the side of the nose right here. It's really dark. So I'll just circle stroke to add a second pass of tone. And then it's just a matter of going back and forth, adding tone, blending it smooth, picking out some highlights with a kneaded eraser as needed and doing it over and over and over again. But if you just work up the drawing like this, so that there's not one part of the face that gets way ahead of the other parts, that is the best way to go. So you can see it all come together at the same time. A bit more shadow under the nose here, a bit more shadow on the side of the nostril. And then after adding that additional tone, I blend it with my tortillon. And always use the largest one that you can for the area so that you get the smoothest pass possible. And then you'll notice that it will look really too intensely dark after laying down the tone. But before you make adjustments, push forward a bit more of the face because it's not about how dark this one patch is, it's about how it looks as a balanced part of the entire portrait. So if you look at the reference material, this is the darkest part of the portrait. And since I don't have a lot of tone on the rest of the face yet, it's not surprising that it looks almost out of place. But if you do need to lighten it, decide that you have gone overboard, get your tort or uh, get your chamois cloth out and just blend over the top because the chamois cloth will always lighten the area as well as blending it smooth. It picks up the pencil especially when you're working with charcoal. See, so then you can get a really smooth, natural lightening as opposed to using an eraser, which is going to be blotchy. And then re-darken in the nostril after blending, bring that out again. clean up some of those lines by bringing them out again, but then I don't want it to look too outlined, so I might need to circle on one side to bring that line out, and blend it out. Then you can also use your kneaded eraser. Let's say that I've worked this up as much as I want, and I just need to bring out some of these wrinkles. Not all the lines need to be drawn. You can also use an eraser and get some really cool effects that way. This works especially well in wrinkles. So if you just pull out one side of that wrinkle, you'll have a clear distinguished line that doesn't look like a line because it's actually a negative line. I'm also going to bring that out on places like the side of the nostril in areas where I have some reflected light. So you're going to get reflected light wherever there's a really strong contour. So here at the edge of the nose, or here at the side of the face or side of the neck, you'll often see an area, a very thin line of reflected light, even right before the shadow goes to the very darkest. So if you pull those lines out with a kneaded eraser, 
that can be a, a more effective way of making it a realistic portrait. You can do that same sort of work in the lips to bring out some of those little tiny highlights in the lines of her lips. And don't neglect them in the darkest places because that's where it's going to be most effective. Remember, your eye is always drawn to areas of contrast. So an area of highlight right before a really dark area is going to be very eye-catching. So you've got that, and then go back with your pencil and darken one side of that highlight line and then you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the strong contrast, you're getting the strong line, and it still doesn't look outlined. It looks more realistic and organic, like it belongs on the face. So let me go over the portrait doing this kind of work. It's going to take a while. Now this is the same thing over and over again. So there's not anything new to teach you. It's just a matter of doing those three things. It's just a matter of doing those three things over and over and over again. So I'm going to add some tone. I'm going to blend and I'm going to pull out highlights over the entire face. I'm going to pay close attention to my reference material so that I know where to do that. And that is all there is to it. Then it's just a matter of putting in the time. So I'm going to put in some time off camera and I'll come back to you when we've pushed it up a little bit more. Okay, this is the portrait after doing a little bit of that off camera rendering. So now I'm in a better position to do more of the same really. It's just at this stage it's time to pull out some more highlights. So I'm going to go into the eyebrows and I'm going to flatten my kneaded eraser into a blade and pull out some of those fine white hairs. I'm going to do the same thing in the hair. Just, I can only pull out maybe two or three hairs and then I have to re-flatten to get a clean spot again. I can clean up the ears, clean up some highlights on those curls, and then go into the wrinkles under the mouth as well, and pull out some highlight lines there, and top of the mouth here, I've got some fine line wrinkles, so I'm just sort of doing this sort of work all over. Don't forget to pull out some highlights in the corners of the eyes and right on the bottom lid right above the bottom lid there's a little bit of a highlight edge there too but yeah this is an easy way to just get some of those delicate wrinkles in the face See some in the chin and of course in the neck here. And they're all easily put in with that kneaded eraser.
And then you can go back with the pencil and just darken up one side of that wrinkle. So you just darken it up like this, then you get that little bit of your, then you get that small tortillon and circle stroke out from that dark side. So then it looks like a little indented line in the skin, which is exactly what a wrinkle is. See? It works really well. And I can also add those little bitty eyelashes. And there's some eyelashes on the under eye too. Those small details that make such a big difference. This is that face. Okay, so in this final phase, I'm just going to do some of this line work, pulling out some more wrinkles, pulling out a few more highlights in the hair. If you squint at your uh, reference material, you'll see that there's a band of highlight right here on the bangs, and then just a few that catch in other parts, but I'm going to clean up that band. and. A similar band on this side. So I'll clean up that band of highlight and then break into it again with a um, blender tool like this. Sometimes going all the way across and sometimes just going part lay up. Okay, so that's all there is to making that hair, those little lines that we pulled out are going to be really helpful. And now I'm going to add a few shedded or uh, and you can add some really light lines using your stomp after you've been using it to blend because there's plenty of charcoal on the tip there. So you can just use it like a pencil, adding some more tone. And it's going to give you a smooth, really subtle edge. Okay, so let me finish this up off camera, doing those sorts of smallest little details, and I'll come back to you one last time and show you the finished result. Okay, this is the finished portrait. So here's the picture that we started with, and here's the finished portrait. So I went ahead and just I'm not going to do that black background this time because I like these flyaway hairs to be more visible. If you focus in, the way that I finished up with those flyaways was just to add some graphite pencil because that can get sharper and it's better for those light areas like the hairs. So if you combine charcoal and graphite, just remember that charcoal 
cannot go over the top of graphite, but graphite can go over the top of charcoal. So for finishing touches, graphite is great. But because graphite is so slippery, charcoal won't over sit over the top of a really dense matted area of um, solid graphite. So don't expect that you can go back and darken something up. Okay? But hopefully this tutorial has taught you some things about drawing people with wrinkles and drawing realistic hair using your kneaded eraser to great effect. At least I hope that you've learned some things from it. And I hope that you join me next month for another drawing tutorial. Thanks so much for watching.